everybody? Josh Wilson, and this is the Big Dog Podcast. These next couple of weeks, we are celebrating one year anniversary of the podcast launching. And so Jonathan, and I thought it would be fun if we kind of recapped some of our favorite moments over the last year and some of your guys' favorite moments. So what you're going to be hearing today are some of our literally favorite moments of a couple episodes uh, that took place over that last year. And that's, what's going to play out over the next several weeks. So no guests live in the studio. I'm not sharing thoughts. We just know that there's so many new listeners, you know, over these last 12 months and we've grown so much in, in recent months, we want to kind of recap those highlights for you. So that's what you're going to experience. I hope that you love it. Hope that you share it. And we're going to be back in the next, next couple of weeks some amazing content, some incredible guests, and I appreciate you guys so much. We'll see you soon. Okay. All right, so look, so Baver's Board and Daycare has been a dream of mine, a conversation of uh, my wife and I for years. Gosh, we've been talking about doing a board and daycare place forever, probably about three, four years into uh, our dog training business, which is off-leash canine training. Shout out. You'll hear a lot more about that on the podcast, I'm sure. Um you know, it, it's always been there in the back of our mind, but the training has been growing so much and that business has been so good to us. Um, that dream kind of took a backseat to it. Then one day, November, 2019, I'm driving down route 17 here in, uh, the beautiful metropolis of Yorktown, Virginia. And I see this dump, literally a dump on the side of the road great location for a dump mind you i don't know why in york county we have all these dumps in like premier why great is that spot. has it been here forever yeah that's what they told us okay so anyway there's They're a like grandfathered into that spot dump on the side of the road and i was like ooh, i could put some makeup on that pig like this thing is looking good so i flip a u-turn because i see a sign it says for lease and i'm like hey let me call see what's up place needs a lot of work but let me see what's going on how bad could it actually be? So I call, gentleman opens opens the phone, answers the phone, and says, yeah, he flip gives phone. me some information. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Art, I mean, Art's gangster. He's got a flip phone for sure. <laughs> I love Art. Does. Shout out to Art. Um, he was integral in making Bay Rivers happen. Um, anyway, we have a great conversation, and we set up a time to meet the next day. So I holler at Katie. I'm like, yo, tomorrow, what are you doing at 11 o'clock? I got something I want to show you. Um, be open-minded because you're going to need to be open-minded. And we show up at 1948 George Washington Memorial Highway for this meeting to look at this property. And um, to say it was in disarray is probably, what do you think? Compliment? Yes. Saying too much? Yes. What... It was a disaster. Okay. <laughs> That's a good word. That's fair. That's fair. Um, I mean, guys, this was this was a hot mess. And for those of you uh, listening to this and watching this on YouTube, we'll, we'll get some slides and some shots thrown in for you. Um, for those of you who aren't, we'll put a link in comments for you to be able to go and see some of the before photos of, of what's going on. Jonathan, we can do that, right? put some, put a link in the comments or whatever. My, okay. My tech guy over here helping us out. Cause I don't really know a damn thing. I'm just saying stuff. So <laughs> look, um, you know, so you can actually see this thing that we walked into. Um, this place was so bad, so bad guys. I didn't even tell my wife about it until I had already signed the lease and made a commitment to it for, um, a long period of time. God bless Devin. So Katie, what were your initial thoughts when we got to this beautiful property? Well, it's super funny because you totally thought I was going to hate it and completely shit on it and just basically walk away, I would assume. Um, but I was all about it and you were shocked. And I actually really remember you being so shocked that day that I actually liked it. <laughs> no, you were pretty high on it. So... I mean, obviously not liked it how it was, but I saw the sure. potential in it. I liked yeah. the location. You, as we're walking around, you're showing me things and we're like, we could do this here and do that here. We had like probably 15 dozen different like layouts and how we do this there and whatever. Yeah. And I obviously couldn't really wrap my head, head around the whole remodel flip part of it. Cause that's just kind of an unknown territory to me. But if you told me that you could do it when I came up with ideas and you were like, yeah, we could do that. I was like, all right, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So as long as as I got the okay, I was pretty hype on it. But yeah, it was a disaster. Yeah, the um, you know the way my brain works, and and guys, this this is actually episode two of of our podcast for those joining us, and um, you know we're just getting this thing going, and we got some stories to tell and and life to share, and you'll learn more about me and my history and my background as we kind of unbox this this podcast and go down the road and bringing in great people. But um, I, I can see things for what they can be and not what they are. And this place, what it was, ooh, uh, it was a mess. And it was really exciting to me and very encouraging when Katie was excited about it. Um, my wife, when I finally brought her out there, yeah, you know, she didn't even she didn't even freak out. But we have a history of me taking things that are a mess and 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 fixing them and and getting them right. Um, the thing that was crazy about this place, and as I think back on it, is outside of sketching some things in the in the book, in my book, everything was in my head. There were no formal plans. There was no nothing. It's just as we walked around eight foot piles, a hundred yards long, of trash and debris from the previous. And dirt and tenants where they just dumped all their crap for eight years. It. it was crazy. I think that place was that place was made up of corona caps, landscaping debris. A car. Don't forget about the car uh, underneath the hill. Oh, there was a car buried back there. There was a what else? A U Haul box truck shell. Oh yeah. I mean we've guys, the Brought more the more we dug and moved stuff out, it was freaking bonkers. But the whole time, none of that was really intimidating. We were just super hype about it, really excited. And we had a vision of what it could be. And while it was super expensive to flip, the price was right. Again, shout out to Art. Thanks, brother. <laughs> you know, it was good. Um, Can you talk about what you thought your budget would be going? Like, just the gap, not the numbers, but just, like, uh, how much you increased the original budget? Because that's pretty comical to me, too. Uh, I mean, yeah, my mind, let's say I was going to do it for a buck fifty. In my mind, it was going to be a buck fifty out of comma and zeros, and lots of zeros, and maybe some numbers in front of the comma, and it ended up being closer to like you know three fifty. <laughs> uh, so my point in that is you went well above your intended budget. Uh, sure, yes, and again, once you start putting makeup on a pig, yes, if that pig's a little bigger than you thought, I mean, people who are in real and estate, certain, people that you have certain styles on things. Well, sure. It wasn't going to be ratchet. How many times? It, yeah, that's what I was saying. How many times was I like, Josh, this is just like, let's do this one. It's a little bit more, you know, budget friendly, cheaper. And you're like, nah, we're going to bid. We're going to style. And that was like well, times yeah. 10. It, it, it has to be on brand. Yes. You know, when people bring their dogs to off-leash canine training, what do they expect? The best. Yes. The excellent. best. And not just like, you know, the, the best training, the experience is going to be the best. You can't have a normal door to open up you need to have a a, a sliding barn door yeah i mean who doesn't love a sliding i feel like you're throwing some shade at me with the barn I'm not, door. it's I awesome mean, i love it. it's so trendy you know what drives me nuts about it though it stays open it stays open so you know little flip note for those out there who are into you know think about flipping houses or renovating commercial buildings um you know <laughs> this property guys diving in a little deeper there this property was a home built in like the early 1940s, a very small, like two bedroom house, no bathroom, no nothing. And then I think at some point in the mid 1900s, they drank too much and they decided to build like a warehouse in front of this home and then down the side of it. Then they drank again and they built some crazy garage off the side of it. Then they drank some more a couple decades later and built this crazy metal building in the back. And it just ended up being this hodgepodge of rooms and buildings oh, and spaces yeah. um nothing's square nothing's even nothing's level um and we freaking wrecked that place i mean we stripped it down everything i mean you had you cleared it out and you had to like i don't even know what they did that floor in the warehouse to clean it all the chemicals oh and yeah it was everything crazy. was in there the treatments they had to do yeah and the warehouse what they have um a bunch of landscaping equipment equipment like mowers stuff rusting everywhere oil like into the ground yeah we had to grind the hell out of that floor yeah and then we came in and, and put new stuff in i mean guys like i said we're gonna put pictures and, and link in the comments so you can see kind of the before and afters of it 
But this thing was a mess. And, and all these things to say is it was a mess. It was an ordeal. But, man, we were hype about it. We were super hype about it. And, and we signed all the paperwork on this place in uh, late November, I think right around Thanksgiving. You know, we got it under contract. Um, we took possession of the property the first of the year. We were, were celebrated, you know, New Year's up in Northern Virginia uh, with my godson and his family and close friends of ours from college. And then we, we came back quick. I mean, we came back quick because I could not wait to dive into this project. And so January 1 hits, boom, we're like, peace out, we're gone. We're going back to Hampton Roads. We got work to do. And we get to work. And we are freaking just picking up trash. We got tractors on site, bulldozers, excavators. Uh, we're doing demo. I mean, we hit this sucker hard. We're rocking and rolling, and we're making great progress. We were talking about opening up April 1st is what I said I could do this project in 90 days. Katie, being very realistic, said, mm, are you sure? Like, we need to hire staff. We need to do this and that. I was gung-ho. I was fired up. We were just. If you give yourself a strict deadline, then you know for sure you'll hit it at a reasonable deadline. Yeah, a reasonable deadline. Then what happened? The Rona. The Rona. Or COVID-19, COVID-19 specifically. Is that what it's still called? I don't know. So where did the 19 come from? Do you know? Because it's I think because it started in 2019, even though it hit us in 2020. Okay. I think it's... Of Corona? Don't fact check this. <laughs> yeah, guys, this, this is not... Neither one of us probably not actually know. You know how, like, when people start talking about stocks and stuff, like, this is not financial advice. This is not medical advice. Please consult your physician don't, or... Don't fact check You this. know, your York County 411 for medical advice and things like that. You know, if you want to know whether you should get vaccinated, let me stop before I start going <laughs> down a whole nother, whole nother deal. Do what you want to do. It's you and your body, and it's all good. Lab rats. So, here we go. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, Rona hit and, you know, everybody like us, like everyone else or like whatever. So, you know, bird flu is going around. It's no big deal. Everything's fine. No one's going to be stressing out. It's just something for the news to talk about. Well, then all of a sudden they're like, you know, we get into March and we're, we're cruising along with construction, but there's a lot of talk and like, oh, Jokers are falling out from this thing? Well, this is kind of weird. What do you mean they're running out of beds in hospitals in New York? What do you mean places in Florida are, like, slammed with people? What? This is getting kind of interesting. This is getting kind of weird. But I just still kind of had, not my head in, in the sand. I mean, my head was in, like, construction. And so, you know, roofing. Yes. And flooring. Flooring. And things like that. Dirt. Dirt. <laughs> Asphalt. <laughs> All these things, you know, we're plugging along. We're trying to get things going, um, you know, shooting for an April 1st opening date that even without Rona wasn't definitely looking like it was going to happen anyway. Um, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, your kids aren't going back to school. You know, a long weekend turned into a two year. Weeks. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, it turned into two weeks. So that, was a, that was like the longest two weeks for me because it was like the long weekend was like, oh, this is odd. Yeah. Two weeks. Holy shit. What did they close down for two weeks for? Like yeah. nothing. And then, yeah. then yeah. Then and then it was, we're just not going back to school for the rest of the year. And here we are now, May of 21. And my daughter just went back to school three weeks ago. Logan won't go back till the fall. And it's just been a crazy time. And everybody obviously knows what we're talking about, has experienced that. But when you're in the middle of a construction project, when you are opening a boarding and daycare business and your livelihood is dependent upon people, two things mainly, going to work and traveling. Yep. Um, I've done some stupid shit in my life and I didn't think this was one of them, but I would not recommend opening a boarding and daycare business to, uh, to anyone particularly during a world travel ban. I was say you didn't really like think that through of all the things that could go wrong in opening a boarding and daycare business. You never thought like maybe there's this like disease that go across <laughs> the entire world and just shut everything down. Never crossed no, your mind? No, Weird. that never crossed my mind. And, um, you know, next time <laughs> I'll, I'll think a little more about it. But, you know, when, when COVID hit and they shut everything down, I mean, it was, 
it was terrifying. I mean, we, you and I are having conversations like on the training side, you know, forget the construction project. Now, you know, we've got a training business, dozens of trainers, locations across the country. And we're yeah, like, I think at that point it was just like, nobody knew what to really think of it. So even the ones nothing. like you have your certain feelings about it. Yeah. And even you were kind of like, what do we like? What if this actually turns into something? What we yeah. got to have a plan. Yeah. And I remember that like very vividly. You're said you came to my office door and you were like, Katie, like we really got to come up with a plan. If, if people, you know, stay scared of this thing or if this thing really turns into something, like we need to have a strategy to where we could still train dogs, but we got to come up with a plan of who's yeah. with us doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were terrified and, you know, there was probably three or four weeks there where, you know, the phone stopped ringing and, it just was, it was a very nerve wracking time because we just didn't know like everybody else. Um, you know, and then you factor in, all right, you know, my family and I were, were, were all in on this construction project to open up this new business and we started interviewing and hiring people and we're like, wait, we, we can't hire anybody because what if they shut us down right when we open and now we're responsible for all these people and yeah, that was definitely a weird thing. Cost. Like we're talking about like maybe having to let people go and then also hire hiring people for another like company. Makes, yeah, it was weird. It was super frustrating. And so, you know, it was very frustrating. It was really stressful. It was I mean, it was terrifying. I remember one day, and I don't even know if I don't know if I've ever even shared with you what I'm about to share with you actually. Oh, no. Podcast exclusive. Oh wow. You um, be here first. There was one day and it had to be late March, right after they shut everything down. And we're like a week into that. And there's so much unknown and just all this stuff. And we're just like freaking hemorrhaging cash on this construction project. And there is no money coming in because everybody rightly so is freaking out and trying to figure out what's going on. And I'm just like, 25,000 here, 30,000 here, 15,000, 1,000, 1,200, 300. Oh, let me grab something to eat. Nope, that's too expensive. Let me do this. <laughs> let, me let me get that, that McDonald's Happy Meal. And, you know, we're, we're, we've blown through our, our planned budget of what we thought was going to be. Um, and look, that's the thing. Budget's a budget, right? Budget's an idea. I mean, it, it, it gives you some guidelines. We blew through that joker. Um, Early. I, I it was a lot more than, than we expected it to be. But, you know, contractors had to change. Things change. Things change. Anyway, I'm sitting there, and I am I'm in a super, super, super bad way. Like, I am feeling down. I am, like, I'm scared. Like, I'm legitimately scared. And I'm just walking around the job site, and... Um, People could ask me, like, Josh, you okay? I mean, we had a lot of contractors there and stuff, and I'm not usually looking down. I always look pissed, but even when I'm relaxed, I look pissed. But this was like, I I just didn't look good. I looked sad. I looked concerned, and I don't normally look concerned. Um, and I just remember just like, God, like, what, what are we going to do? Like, legit, I got all this stuff I got to keep pressing on. Like, money's getting tight, like, you know, what am I going to do? How are we going to get through this? I'm like, I just, uh, I was like, I just don't know what we're going to do. And I'm walking around the job site. And for whatever reason, I walk up to the front and there's nothing ever going on in the front. Everything's back on the job site inside or in the back. And I walk up to my front and two angels pulled into the parking lot. My mom and Mamu. Oh, not announced, not anything. They just stopped by to check on me. They felt like they should check on me. And it was absolutely my lowest day of this entire project. Do they know that? Uh, yes, they know that. Yes, because I went out to the car. I'm talking to uh, my mom. I walk out. I think it was raining a little bit. And I walk out there. And mom's like, hey, babe. Mom was like, hey, and we're talking and whatever. My mom's like, what's going on? And I get in the backseat of her car. And I just freaking start bawling. I literally broke down and I probably spent, I should probably put, spent 45 minutes to an hour in the backseat of my mom's car, 41 year old grown ass man. That and, <laughs> um, I freaking, uh, I, I mean, I bawled. I, I was a freaking wreck. There's all this like 
stress and anxiety and pressure, which I love pressure. Pressure does not bother me. I was not in a good way. And um, per usual, Ma and Mamu hyped me up. And that's why they kept doing all these random check-ins. Just stopping by. Just stopping by. You probably saw them checking in a little more often after that. Was that a few Um, weeks in? Because they definitely started to after that. (laughs) Yeah. It. I mean, it was. um, It was a time, and I was freaked out. I was not doing well. Um, I mean, some would say I like to control things. Katie, I don't know how you feel about that, but working for me for the last ten years or so. Um, (laughs) um, Control never heard of her. I don't know. But yeah, I just was in a terrible way. And I, I mean, I was depressed. I was scared. Um, I felt un, incapable of finishing the project. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do with our teams and our staff and um, was a freaking mess. And Mamu says something to me all the time. Not all the time, but timely. And her dad used to say, um, uh, can't never did, can't never did anything. You can. And, um, uh, I just remember in the front seat telling me that she's like, Joshua can't never did anything. You can. And I was like, yeah, mama, that you're right. I can like, <laughs> I can, we'll bleep that out. Jonathan. Um, can't say that word here. I mean, who am I kidding? Sorry, babe. I said an F word. <laughs> Mom, apologies. Mamu. I know I didn't cuss at you. This was really for the podcast, and I said the F word. I apologize. Spotify, like the algorithm yeah. Oh, wow, sweet. Spotify. I waited till at least 20 minutes in to drop an F bomb. Yeah. So cheers to Spotify. You can find us on all platforms. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, like that was a crazy, crazy moment. And, um, you know, I had some conversations with my mom, had some conversations with Mamu. A lot of encouragement from them and you know just kind of got my head back right but it i think about that day often often and how like i'm terrible at asking for help i'm i'm like the worst at it and i let myself get to this crazy point of just stress and pressure and fear and anxiety and it's like crippling and unannounced out of nowhere they show up because mom and mom will always show up yeah. at the right They're time. The best. They are literally the best. So that would be a dope episode. Mom Get and mom, mom and here. mom in here. Oh my God. Yeah. All right. That's going to happen. We're going to do that for sure. All right, cool. So we'll get them in here on this thing and, and it's some fun. So that, you know, we're, we're, we're in a really low spot and I, I share that little story. One, I hope you're picking up on how much I love these two women guys who are out there listening. Like my mother and my grandmother are very, very important to me. Um, and that was like the low point that's late March going into early April. I made a decision early April that we were going to postpone opening. Um, and that lasted about two and a half weeks. You know, we kept pressing on with construction. We kept pressing contractors hard to get stuff done. And then it was, I think it was like around the 17th, 18th of April, work for all intents and purposes as far as what was going to be done for us to be able to open and safely house animals and care for animals we were ready it was a staffing thing it was a is this the right timing thing right i mean those were the issues that we talked about and we agreed we were going to wait till like mid-may maybe late may Mm -hmm. and then sunday night i think it was april 20th I sent you a text at like 10 o'clock. What, what was that text like? Something along the lines of let's just do it. One week. Can, yeah. we, have, can we have hires ready? Can we be ready to go? Yeah, one, one week. week. Can and we get it all done? How do you feel when I sent that? Oh, I was fired up. Yeah. When we, t- when we first talked about um, postponing, I was all about that because I felt like that was just like the smart thing to do because I was also equally terrified of like and confused on what, COVID was yeah. and what it was doing to our country. And, you know, I had some people that were like working harder than ever as far as trying to keep their job. And I had some people already laid off that I knew. And it's just like, it was really weird thing to wrap your mind around. But when you texted me, like, let's just do it. I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so they can hit you up 
on email. Yep. They can hit you up, call, whatever. And you've got your team. I mean, you've got the creatives. You've got the talent as far as. I'll have my sixth full-time together. person starting Monday. And good for you. And wh- how long now has it been since you launched My first it? full-time, I launched April 2019. Um, <clears throat> I think we did 60 grand our first year, 58 grand, something yeah, like that. Yeah, good for you. Man. March of the next year. So March 1st, 2020, I bring on Savannah. Yeah. March 13th, the world gets shut down. <laughs> I called her back. I was like, hey, just so you know, I'm not going to fire you because I have to have you. Right. We're going to weather this together. We're going to figure it out. Yeah. And we did. Went through some pretty tough times. And then as quick as we went through tough times, we started this. And we haven't slowed down. Yeah, And awesome. it's crazy. It's nuts. So what do you, um, you good on time? Yeah. I got a few minutes. I probably got like okay. 15, 10, 15 minutes. Perfect. We're going to keep this going then. What, um, what do you credit? that too i mean because you're young man this this business is young this is new and it's a maybe not locally it's a heavily populated space but overall i feel like what you're doing is a maybe not uh expertise and and talent wise a heavily populated space but advertising because yeah, everybody says they're an ad agency right it's like a super heavy a space so what do you credit you know the progression and the growth and, you know, that, that trajectory to so early on during a crazy time when companies, most of the people I talk to are not interested in putting money out the last 12 months. Um, I think that, so our, we have a twofold mission. I wish I could get it to one sentence. I'm getting ready to, this girl I'm bringing in Monday. She's a writer. So she's going to help me get this into She'll one succinct to statement. Yeah. But our mission's twofold. Number one is to maximize the positive exposure of our clients. Okay. Plain and simple. If we're not doing that. We're totally screwing up. Second part of our mission is to create the greatest place in Hampton Roads to work. It's awesome. So everything goes through those two filters. Yeah. And so like when that, that is our compass, that's our North star. Like that defines us. Right. As far as the progression, um, I, f- I feel like anyone could have done what we did given the right circumstances and given and that's, that, that's the tough thing, man. I think a lot of CEOs are like, well, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. And you could go do those same things and contextually it might work, it might not. Right. It worked for them at that time for a certain number of reasons. Yeah. That's why I'm really careful about like, because I'm awesome. Right, yeah. I think there's some things that I do that are awesome. Sure. And there's some things that I do that drive people crazy. My team and my wife would tell you that. Yeah. So there's two big things. Um, when My team we, is not hopefully not going to comment on that statement. <laughs> <regarding>. <laughs> there's one like... Yeah, I mean, okay, there's one really, really cool thing that we did last year. Do you know the story about Mix and Shine? Uh-uh. About the other ad agency? No. So these uh, amazing uh, two girls, um, April and Rachel, they own this company called Mix and Shine in okay. Virginia Beach. They contact me. They're like, because we were doing a podcast at that time, yep. Tom Hustle. Like, hey, can you show us how to do this? We Our podcast is a dumpster fire. Can't okay. figure it out, whatever. And so they came over and I was like telling them like, here's how you get a great sound out of your mics. Yeah. Here's how you record it. Here's how, you know, all this stuff. Right. Sure. And I, they paid, I think I charged like 75 bucks an hour or some kind kind of reasonable, I think ish consulting fee. And so they were over at the house like three or four hours. They came in their podcast, you know, started elevating. And then, uh, we just kind of kept, kept up Yeah. actually. Um, and we both kind of like paid for each, like the things from each other for a while. Like they did this class on Facebook ads. I okay. said, Savannah, we paid for it. Right? Yeah, sure. Um, and that, and then she would call to ask me things. I would call to ask her things. We wouldn't really bill. Yeah. It was just kind of a good back and forth feel good yeah. partnership. And then, um, fast forward to the pandemic. So March 1st or March 13th, everything shuts down in Hampton roads. Yep. I had six retainer clients by April 20th, the next month, Five out of six had backed out. Yep. So my revenue stream, other than one-off deals, was gone. Right. And so I came to Savannah. I was like, hey, just as a follow-up to our previous conversation, I'm not going to fire you still. Right. We are going to find a way to weather this. I don't know what that looks like. Sure. I will say that a couple of the clients, I begged them to continue because it was more beneficial for them. And I was like, look, I'm charging you this discounted rate based on the commitment to the retainer. Right. So if you cancel, there's going to be a fee. It's going to yeah. be a big fee. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, it's fine. Like we're, su- we're kind of scared. We don't want to push. And so they paid this money and that carried us for a little while. Sure. We had a very small PPP loan that yep. they only based off of my 1099 earnings <laughs> right. from 2019. Right. So I think I, I got everything I could get and it was like three grand. Yep. You know, so like, and so that we had that and, and this 
you know, cancellation and a couple of one-off deals to sustain us. Yeah. And I was like, Savannah, we, uh, I don't know, we, we have to start thinking, we have to pivot. We have to figure something out. For sure. And so we started doing these super cheap videos. I, I might have even, I don't know, I can't remember, but I might have hit you up. I'm like, hey, we're doing this package. It's photo, it's video, it's this, it's that. It's 75% off. Like yeah. we were doing like yeah. what we would charge three to five grand for. Sure. For like, it was $675 or $656 or something. Yep. So a few people took us up on that and that was, that helped us pay rent, helped me pay sure. her. Yeah. Right. And then there was a week that came and this is the cool thing. This, there was a week that came, we had nothing going on. I was like, Hey, we, while we have nothing going on, work on systems and processes. Okay. And if you get through that, work on this and this. And I'm like, and when you start playing solitaire, give me a call. <laughs> like, I'll figure out something else. <laughs> Cause like I, that was when things were mega restricted, right, like, yeah. you know, so she, she called me, she's like, yeah, I'm done. And I was like, crap, like, what are we going to do? Yeah. So just, I got this idea. I called mix and shine. I called April or uh, I called Rachel. Okay. I was like, Hey, crazy question. Um, I know that you had tried to send me a couple of video referrals and stuff. That's awesome. Um, would you guys be interested in a video? And I said, here, here's why I'm asking. Um, I've got this equipment just sitting here. I'm paying this girl's full-time salary and nothing's happening. And like, it, I think it would be the best use of our time if we just continue to work. Sure. Like, and so let me just do this video for you guys, like on the house. And I'm sure that I'll need something one day. They're very good with PR yeah, brand yeah. messaging. And I think even like crisis management in certain situations, sure. like that's their whole shtick. And they come from a big agency okay. before they started their deal. And so they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. So I just did this video for them. Didn't charge them. Okay. And they loved the video. And then their clients started asking about the video. Their video. And then before long, Sentara came along. Yep. And then before long, Sweet Pea Frozen Desserts came along. Yep. And now it's Taylor's Do It starting pretty soon. And now it's Optima Insurance. And now yeah, it's that's like, awesome. And they have just sent us a wave of business. I don't even know what it comes. I mean, it's a very significant piece of what we do. Yeah because I took this risk and said, Hey, let me do this. Yeah. Okay. That was super lucky. That was an outlier sure. type situation. Well, I would push back a little bit and say, not lucky. You're doing the work you chose right. to not go idle, to not do nothing. You did the work. Sure. And you don't have to say, yeah, I'm awesome. And all these things, and all this stuff. Y'all are just grinding. Here's what I tell people about that situation. If you, if financially, if you have your basis covered, you need to be, you need to be, you need to be working. You need to be right. doing your stuff, figure it out, donate it to a nonprofit or try to forge a relationship. And yeah. now, and I don't know why it took me over a year, about a year to, to think of this, but, but now like that thing was so effective for us. Now I'm thinking about other businesses that I could go to and say, Hey, right. I know this sounds crazy. I'd like to do a free video for you. Yeah. I'm sure I'll need something from you at some point. Yeah. This your is not like, I'm, I know you're going to say that <laughs> like they're in my pocket. That's right. No, I would just say like this, this can work out. I just want you to experience what we have to offer. And if you sure. can tell someone great, if you can't, whatever. And it's gotta be strategic, but a lot of people like, uh, I would say a lot of people like villainize free or cheap work. Sure. And like really a lot of people just have to eat like, and it's better. I, I would think it's better to, to, to do the work and get better and like, make a difference than just right. do nothing. My yep. freaking equipment was sitting there and I was paying a full-time salary. Right. What? And like, and I agree. she, yeah. I so agree. like that was a huge turning point for us. Huge turning point. I think beyond that, I think that it would just be like us trying to be intentional about creating a really, really good space yeah. for people to be in. It's not systems and processes. It's not my leadership. My leadership isn't bad. Right. But I would tell you that um, I'm so opposed to micromanagement that the pendulum swings the complete opposite sure. direction. 100%. And what that turns into is under communicating. People think that you're, are they, is he mad at me? Is he upset with me? Yep. Why is he putting me in this situation where he's giving me these expectations and then not communicated whatever? Sure. And I'm over there like being like the heat, like, look at me. I'm such a good boss. I'm not micromanaging. I'm right. just my employees. I'm like, cool dad. And they're sitting there kind of wondering like, what, what the heck do am I, I do? supposed to be doing? Yeah. So like you, you just because like you're the cool boss or you're trying to create this cool culture sure. or whatever, yeah. it can be extremely ineffective. Right. And I'm, that's something I'm having to grow. And then how frustrating do you find yourself getting how frustrated when you're like, why are they doing that wrong? Why is that it's screwed pretty frustrated. up? Because you feel like I've given you this space. Yeah. I've clearly communicated what needs to be done, but the reality is with that, that freedom and not 
micromanaging. You know, like you said, you went, you swing too far the other way, give that freedom. And a little yeah. bit of that comes from maybe yeah. past positions where it was very micromanaged. You're like, I didn't like that at all. Right. And now there's this, this land of confusion, which ultimately when something isn't executed to where you felt like you communicated clicks, I experienced this also, Yeah. you know, you in this land of confusion, things aren't executed how you expected it to be. Right but we failed on the communication piece of what it actually needed to be. And then we wonder, why don't they just get it? Yeah. Well, no one's reading my mind. <laughs> and I'll tell you that like people say like awareness is everything. I'll tell you that awareness is almost everything, but it's sure. not the solution yeah. because I've been yeah. aware of this for a while and I've had to figure out like, yep. how do we compensate for this? And I think a lot of it's systems. Yeah. I think a lot of it is being intentional about learning how to be a better communicator and trying to work on those things. Yeah. But like that, that is a, a big piece of it. I would say the second thing, the, the second thing is just trying to be really committed to excellence and owning mistakes because we've yeah, made mistakes. For sure. And I think when we've come back to customers and said, hey, we really dropped the ball on this. I'm really sorry. Yeah. We'll fix it or we'll eat it or we'll do both or whatever we need to do. We're committed sure. to making it happen. And yeah. that has been pretty paramount for us because I think if you had all my clients in this room or just a handful yeah. and we said, yeah, patient advocate, have we hit it out of the park every time? Mix and shine, have we hit it out of the park every time? I think we say, well, Eight or nine out of 10. Yeah. Right? More times than not. Right. But there's times we've made mistakes and we've had to like, okay, but how do we fix it? What do yeah. we do? What, what can satisfy this? And that's, that's just a big piece of it, man. Yeah. And when you're good to your people, even if you're under communicating, if you're good to your people and, and like you create this space, I just feel like that creates this foundation for being able to invest in people and have them stick around. Yeah. But the ownership too of it, like the ownership of the failure of the disconnect of the underperformance right? You didn't deliver what they, the client really expected, you know, with regards to that project based on what they thought it was going to be based on your understanding of it. And they just weren't in it. That's why they're like, Oh, you know, eight out of nine times, you know, delivered. Right. But it's the same thing with the team. Um, you know, the ownership goes so far though, the clients come back again and again and again, because when it is a failure, that might be a little aggressive to call it a failure, just a miss, you know, where something doesn't go well, the ownership piece, we work with animals as much as we control and policy and procedure and make sure things are in alignment, we can't control everything when it right. comes to dogs. A dog's going to be a dog, you know, and sometimes there's accidents. Sometimes dog gets sick. Sometimes whatever it tweaks its leg, stepping out of the van. I mean, things happen. And what do we do? We get on the phone, explain to the client, you know, they're seeing report cards from us every day. We over document. So they know the care and health and well-being is a priority to us, our, our yeah. biggest priority. So when there are blips, Clients like, hey, we get it. Well, let's go get the dog checked out. Let's see what's going on. Cool. So, yeah, I mean, you're doing great things in Detroit. I mean, you know, we, I guess about a year ago now, maybe nine months, you know, we sat down, we had the discussion about, hey, you know, you're leading so well in Detroit. Things are going really well. Um, Off Leash Canine Training Guys, one of, one of my businesses, we have locations across the country. Uh, here in Virginia, we're in Detroit. We are in uh, Milwaukee, Des Moines, and San Antonio. and you know, we've got trainers spread out all around. We have head trainers uh, and the growing teams across the board. And, and we sat down and said, hey, I need help. You know, helping to, to answer questions, be available, you know, for the team. And so you stepped into a head head trainer role. I mean, really, for lack of not having a better thing to call it. Yeah. But you went from running Detroit to being a resource to the team as a whole across the country. Yeah. And that's tough. You know, yeah. cause you're getting hit with questions or texts and stuff and you don't have the dog in hand yep. to work with. How has that, uh, transition been like, how have you, how have you felt about it? How has the response been from the team? I mean, cause we are what about nine months into it now. Yeah. Yeah. About nine months, but I actually think it's been a, a very cool transition. I was a little nervous at first because sure. it is a lot, a lot of trainers. Um, but it was cool because now I get to share my knowledge with more people. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love to coach. I love to teach. So it was very cool to be able to share that with more people um, in a cool transition because I get to come here more. Right. So I get to yeah. be or the other locations as well. So um, which is pretty cool to be able to travel more and be focused on my job, for lack of better words, and yeah. the dogs. Um, but it's been a cool transition. Everyone's pretty much adjusted. You know, they they reached out to me for many things. and you guys talked me up a lot to them. So everyone 
definitely flocks to me when I'm here, which is very exciting. And that's cool. Um, yeah, a good compliment. <laughs> Shane, your husband, he's a real MVP because we snatch you up what every other month. Every other month. And then kind of in the off months, you're working with other teams and, yep. and growing up. But you're in Virginia every other month now yep. for a week or so. That's correct. That's cool. That's yes. good. Yep. What, um, tell us, so let's tell us, talk a little bit about that. So Michigan, born and raised. That's correct. Yeah. And Michigan State. Yeah. So I grew up in a small town and for as long as I can remember, um, as soon as we moved out of the city and onto a farm, I was very passionate about animals and yeah. agriculture and livestock and all of that. So I had to go to Michigan state. If you're into agriculture in Michigan, you go to Michigan state. Okay. So, so that's, that's where, where I went. Go. That's where the country folk okay. go. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I went there and studied animal science, um, which is crazy. People are like, what do you do with that? Honestly, my response was probably, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to be a vet for a little bit, but you know what I think if someone tells me they studied animal science is what they do? What? I'm going to tell you straight up. Uh -oh. If I hear someone tell me that, <laughs> all right, I probably, it's probably just a certain aspect of it, but it's all I think they learned how to do is put those arm length <laughs> gloves on and go we in the that. back end of the cow <laughs> or whatever. You know what I'm talking about, Jonathan? Like, yes, violating an animal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's helping them with like tummy trouble and maybe having babies. Right. Is that um, fertilizing them to have babies? Fertilizing yes. is the word. <laughs> well, it's called. Uh huh. Sounds a lot more like violation. It's, now, don't ca it? <laughs> it's called AI. Um, kind of weird. Oh, OK. Yep. Artificial I'm insemination. Yeah, I'm tracking with you. So that's what it is. That's all I think you guys do with that major. Yeah. Well, we did a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> Too much of it. <laughs> So like in school, do they just have like cows at school? We do. We had a full blown farm. No shit. Yeah. So pigs, cows, horses, chickens. We had everything at Michigan State. Yeah. And we raised them. It was the student's responsibility to care for them. Look, JMU, <laughs> you got to step. I, maybe JMU has this. I have no clue, but I don't think they do. Most agricultural schools should have a farm. I don't think JMU is agricultural school. No. We got a lot of people from Northern Virginia and Northern Virginia isn't super <laughs> agriculture. That, that's definitely not it. Yeah. They got a lot of fraternities and sororities. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of those too, though. Michigan State's big, though. Michigan State's big. Bigger or smaller than Michigan? Your eye twitched when you knew the question I was about to ask. Well, that disdain subject. for the University of Michigan. Yes. So they're about the same size. But they always say that Michigan people are more superior and smarter and anyone can get into Michigan State. But the football team definitely is. However, <laughs> it's all about who wins the most. So Michigan it's, State tends to take the cake. At least as of late. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's really funny. Go green. So, <laughs> so Michigan, born and bred. Yes. Fertilizing cows in school. <laughs> One of the or few things some, I did. A handful of them. Yep. Um, how old were you when you guys moved out to like the farm? Well, I was four. We actually were in Dearborn. My okay. whole family's from Dearborn. Um, so we moved from that heavy populated city to Goodrich, Michigan. All right. About an hour north of that onto a farm. And we got anything you could think of. Horses, you had pigs, it. cows, chickens, goats, sheep. We had it all. All right. So siblings on the farm well i have two sisters they're both older okay yep you got two sisters and are they as farmy as you no no not at all okay. not as animal -y as me either okay yeah all right so now tell all of our listeners about um when you came out for training mm -hmm. it was after yeah we had it was just after uh, you finished, um, I'm going to say it wrong. You were like the chairwoman or the co-chair or like the state fair for, for what? <laughs> what? Weren't you judging something or did you finish training with me in Virginia and then you had to go right back to that? Yeah, well, I'm, I still am. I've been for almost 10 years. I'm the superintendent. Superintendent. Yes, for the county fair. Also the vice president for a couple years. So at that time I was the okay. vice president. Yeah. Right. For the county fair. 
Yes. And um, what's one of the things that you judge or you would say you're an expert in? I feel like there's always sheep. A I'm a sheep stuff. person. A yeah. sheep person. Yes. Can you break that down a little bit for me? Because I don't really understand what that means well, exactly. Well, judging sheep. I mean, I was just at a show, you know, last weekend. <laughs> so it was like a 12. You didn't know any of these things, did you, Jonathan? <laughs> No, but I'm 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 just confused. No, just look, stick with me, man, for the ride. So, <laughs> no, so showing sheep or judging sheep is all about uh, <laughs> structure, function, muscle, you know, everything, everything behind it. So, is it a sheep show? It's literally a sheep show, like a dog show, literally. But sheep. Yeah, no, no halter on or anything. They just come out walking that that sheep, and you have to like set it up so it's flexing its muscles. Are you kidding me right now? I'm dead serious. So what? Are, how do you, how the, what do you mean they walk a sheep out? Sheep have muscles. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you eat, right? The muscle. So, but how do they walk the sheep? Out? Literally. So you have your hand on top behind the ears and then under the chin, and you literally like walk it out. You train it. Okay, so, so for those you, listening, literally, it's, it's what she's saying: hand on top of the neck. Hand underneath. Yeah. And you kind of create a collar yep. with your hands and you guide the Correct. sheep out. Correct. However, if your sheep is being pulled or not walking, like if you don't have a 90 degree from the neck to the shoulder. Ooh, deduction. You're out. Oh, you're out. I mean, judge won't even look at you after that. <laughs> the sheep show is so serious. You just have to show off the physique of the lamb. All right. How often do you, fo- what do you call Michigan people? Michiganders? Michigan? Michiganders. Michiganders. How often do Michiganders do sheep shows? Well, the people that are into sheep shows, there's one every weekend. I'm sorry. From- <laughs> I've never heard this in my life. This is incredible. We call them um, jackpot shows. Okay. So you jackpot throughout the entire spring, summer, fall. Okay. And then you attend other national shows like Louisville. Um, we have some in Colorado, some in Texas, like the big time shows. So it's all in preparation for that end goal, the purple ribbon and the green wood chips. That's what everyone strives for. The green wood chips. Yes. Okay. So check it out. <laughs> what, what's the possibility of the next time I'm in Detroit <laughs> being able to go to a sheep show? I mean, I can probably find a sheep show to go to. Okay. All right. I'm going to send you what I'm thinking about when I'm coming up next. I think I'll be there in July again. Okay. And maybe September. Okay. So I'll give you some date ranges. I'm going to need to see this. Uh, It's a sheep show. It's a sheep show. Jonathan, you might have to come with us, get some video. I'm I'm definitely coming with, and I'm getting fried Oreos. Oh, fried Oreos. County fairs are for. Yes. They have those in Michigan. Yes. That's the deal. Okay. Yeah. I'm in. (laughs) <laughs> Let's take a break that day. Um, that's awesome. That's really cool. All right. Yeah. So you're big into the farm life, doing the whole deal. Yeah. You go to Michigan State. You graduate. What's what is the next step from there? What well, are you doing? A step before that. So I actually got a full ride scholarship to a graduate program. Oh, nice. So I declined that. And I decided to graduate. And I didn't know what I was going to do. Okay. Um But after that, you know, I kind of went home. I didn't know. I didn't know. And I found a job posting for a doggy daycare. All right. And that's where I started. Because the animals are your thing. Animals are my thing. Livestock was always my thing. My mom never let me have dogs growing up. So. I didn't know this. Yes. So we had a farm dog, but she wasn't allowed inside. And she wasn't a good dog. She just stayed chained up outside. Um, So she wouldn't let me have dogs. So I decided. I love dogs. I tried to bring a dog home and she made me return it. So hold on. Mama made you. <laughs> Mama made you return a dog. Yes. But you got a million other things on the farm. Yes. But no dogs. Correct. She just doesn't like dogs. She just. It's they okay. were. They, won't they were more work than like the other do- like horses and stuff. They're just in the field. You don't have to yeah. really worry about them. Yeah. But dogs are like more consistent work. So huh. that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. I'm actually shocked by this. So you go full opposite. You go, I I deny this graduate program. I'm going, I'm just home, checking job listings, doggy daycare job. What, room attendant type deal? Literally bottom of the barrel, room attendant, minimum wage. And is this the, 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 
the big doggy daycare place or is this a different, smaller, more local one? More local, small okay. shop. All right. So you go room attendant, yep. bottom rain, wrong, yep. like you're just doing the deal. Yep. Learning what this business is about. Yep. And severe debt, working for minimum wage after I get a four year bachelor's degree. Yeah, but here's the thing, though. How common is that? Like, that is the norm. It is, unfortunately. That is the norm. Or maybe a little better than minimum wage. Maybe. People are like, oh, I got this sweet salary. I'm like, you break that salary out? <laughs> yeah, they just no. found a so- made it sound pretty because it's, it's, it's lumped together. Yes. That's still $7.50 an hour. Correct. Okay. Yes. So you go to the doggy daycare thing. You're there for a bit. Yeah, just over a year. And then you move to another doggy daycare? No, I actually went and worked for a, a food safety company. So I, oh yeah, yeah. So I did food safety stuff. I was there for about a year and a half, um, working with dog food and livestock food and making sure they're up to code and making sure no one gets sick. How did I so, forget about this? Yeah, pretty cool. It was cool being on that side of the world. Um, yeah. I worked with a lot of big time dog food companies like Purina and sure. Um, so it was fun. That's really cool. Yeah, but then. But then I did not like working in an office, so I went back to the dog daycare world. Yeah, you're not an office person. No, Mm -mm, I'm not. So, yeah, I went to a daycare called Dogtopia. Okay. Um, It looked appeasing. The website was good. I knew a lot about the daycare world coming from where I was. Yeah, sure. And I would jump right in as the manager. Oh, so you went from the office dog food job. That's dumbing it down a lot. That's not what it was, obviously, but to managing a location. Correct. Okay. So room attendant for a year. I actually got promoted as a room attendant. So I moved up to the floating or runner position. Yeah. Gotcha. So I knew some, but I wasn't like a manager, manager right. there. And that and Doctopia, for those who don't know, I mean it's a huge franchise. Huge franchise. I mean, it's one of the top. I mean, if not kind of the standard bearer. It is. For a doggy daycare yeah. boarding right now, at least. There's two top companies, so one of two. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. And in a in a massive industry. Massive. They're very consistent, it seems, at least from a branding standpoint and marketing yep. and, and all that. I mean, of course, franchises independently owned and operated, there's gonna be differences but you went into one as a manager yeah and did you end up having multiple stores like how did what was that process like because because i'm gonna be honest, i mean we got her from we stole her we <laughs> yes. we 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 were so appealing <laughs> my pitch was so great that yes. i didn't throw in the part where i'm going to take you on the road to north carolina to the boondocks yeah but, left that part out okay but you know so you get to dogtopia as a manager yeah first real management role yes and what was that like um i think it was fun so my the owner of that specific location owned three locations okay so we worked together as managers between each store so that definitely helped me out um but even coming with no experience i still felt um i guess more prepared than the other managers sure so they actually both left and i was like the lone soldier for quite a while managing Three stores. Three stores. That's pretty awesome. So. Now you're there. You're running the doggy daycare. You're building your teams. Yes. Firing people, hiring people. Constant dealing door. Dealing with dog mess. Yeah. Cleaning kennels. Because when you're in that, that business, boarding and daycare, it, manager, room attendant, it doesn't, matter. it doesn't matter. On any given moment, on any given day, you can be doing any of those roles. Literally. I mean, there was an incident that happened and a girl, you know, had to leave and she left all the dogs out and I had to, it was like 10 o'clock at night, you know, run over there for, I lived the closest. So of course I'm going to run over there. So it was constant, um, phones ringing, people need you. It's, it's definitely a, you gotta know how to hustle when you're working in a daycare world. So that's so cool. So hidden talent of Katie's everybody. Um, so when I was, social media stalking anybody who I'm potentially interested in hiring, I'm noticing, and I'll go and look at the places they manage, like where they work. I'll look at everything. Yeah. And I'm noticing all these incredible pictures of huge groups of dogs. And it's just unbelievable. Like what the hell? Like, how is she doing this? And it's nonstop. Like, this is crazy. So yeah, she has this gift where she can get all these dogs in one spot and this, 
look at the camera and focus and be happy as can be. Yep. And because one of the first things I asked her was, hey, you know, I've been looking at Octopia's Facebook or Instagram. I think it was Facebook. And um, these group pictures are incredible. Who does that stuff for y'all? Like, I do them. <laughs> like, no big deal. Just super nonchalant. And most people struggle to get a picture that's decent of one dog. Right. And you've got, what's the most you've ever had? I mean, one time I had over 20. Yeah, it's crazy. That's what I was going to say, like 25, 26. <laughs> and they're all different sizes, different yeah. breeds. It's just a trip. I mean, photography is definitely my my biggest hobby. So That's I love so it. That's so cool. That's all so from cool. an iPhone, too. Look, people shouldn't sleep on the iPhone. We've got some crazy cameras in here right now. But because I don't know how to work them for shit, <laughs> I would say my iPhone uh, competes pretty heavily. It with, does. With it. But I mean, that was just incredible. That was one of the big things that I, that to me, stood out with everything that I looked at of yours from the past and kind of of your path and your journey, mm -hmm. what you do, what you touch, what you put your time in. There was a layer of excellence <laughs> and extra to all of it. Yeah. Like you're super extra. <laughs> and that's wonderful. Like I love that about you. I'm extra. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with it. So it's all because of my dad, though. I mean, even if we had a homework assignment that looked sloppy in handwriting, we had to start over. So we were always told to strive for the best and be the best. So well, you do that. That's <laughs> for sure. So I you apply for this dog training position. I did. What kind like I know when we spoke, you talked about, hey, you know, we've got all these people come in and I, I enjoy this business. Yeah. I enjoy working with all these dogs. I enjoy working with the clients, but the disconnect for you and, and correct me if I'm wrong though, but I, I feel like I remember it being, it's like, I know that these families, these dogs could do so much more because you were doing some training at that time. I was uh, self-taught training. Sure. But I, I saw so many dogs come in that struggled and parents that struggled and it, yeah. it kind of hurt, you know, sure. it hurt my soul. Cause I, I hate seeing people struggle with their animals. So yeah. I wanted to help in that aspect and that kind of culture. So I saw your job posting. Like, <laughs> I think I'm going to reach out about this. I didn't think I had the traits to be a head trainer, but I thought sure. maybe if I could just be a trainer at that point, I didn't know if you had a location or if you had other yeah. trainers. So. I did have a location. It was going to be your house. Oh. <laughs> and a park. Yeah. You just yeah, didn't literally. Know it yet. <laughs> literally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the great thing about dog training. I mean, you're a wonderful dog trainer. You don't have to have, you know, a huge facility and all these resources and all those things. No, you need to be a good human being, passion for dogs. Mm -hmm willingness to work and be patient with them, communicate with people well, and you can start a dog training business. Yeah. 